Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, I'm gonna show you how I set up a new development machine from scratch. Now, I just got a new MacBook and I haven't done anything to this yet. So it's right out of the box. So the only thing that I've done is go through the initial setup of creating a new user, uh, connecting to my home Wi-Fi so that I can access the internet. And also I installed the software to record this video, but that's it. Um, I don't have any of my development software installed on here or any of my personal preferences set up. So for those of you who have watched my videos before, you've probably seen that I have my terminal set up in a certain way. I have my editor customized how I like it. And I also just have a lot of other different applications that I like to use. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how I use scripts to automate the installation and setup for a large portion of this process. And that's going to cut down on the time all of this takes pretty significantly. So I used to not have any scripts like this. And anytime I got a new machine, it would take me an entire day's worth of work to install all of the software and change all the settings to get it set up the way that I like it. So this should definitely be something that you have scripted out so that you know everything gets set up exactly how you like it in as little time as possible. So that's what we're going to do in this video. Now, this is going to be Mac specific since that's what I use as my main development machine, but you can likely create some sort of automation scripts like this for whatever operating system you use. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, I'm going to install Homebrew. So I released a video last week on how to use Homebrew for the Mac, and I won't go into the deep details on that here, but basically it's a package manager for the Mac operating system, and it's going to allow us to install a lot of software from the command line. In this case, we're actually going to install a lot of software from scripts. So if anyone is interested in learning more about how to use Homebrew, then you can go and watch that video from last week. Now, before we install Homebrew, I'm going to make a quick change to my terminal so that it looks a little more like how I usually have it and also make the font larger so you can see it better. So I'm going to open up my terminal here. And if you've seen my ter uh, videos before, then you can probably tell this looks a lot different than how my terminal is usually set up, but that's all right. My scripts will get all of this set up here soon. But first, let me tweak the preferences here just a little so that we can see this a bit better. So I'm going to open up my terminal preferences here, and I'm going to go to profiles down here to pro and set that as the default so that we have a dark background. I'm also going to change the font here and I'm gonna change the font to a size of 30. And also I'm going to select this anti-alias text. And for the background, I think that the uh, pro is a little bit too uh, transparent. So instead of that being 85% transparent, I'm gonna put it up in the 90s. So I'll set that to 92. Okay, so now let me close that down and reopen it. And now we can see that that looks a little better. We've got a dark background here and the text is larger so that everyone uh, can see that. Okay, so now let's install Homebrew. So to do that, I'm just going to open a browser here and go to Homebrew's homepage so that we can get this installed. Now I don't have any other browsers installed, so I'm gonna use Safari here. And I'm just going to search for Homebrew Mac and go to their homepage. And right at the top of their homepage, they have the command for how to install Homebrew. So this is a Ruby command, and we're gonna run this within our terminal. So I'm just going to copy that, and then let me minimize the browser. And I'm gonna paste that into my terminal. So now I'm going to run that, and then it says to hit enter to return. And now we also need to put in our password. So now that's going to install Homebrew. So I am going to uh, pause the video and then pick this back up whenever that finishes. Okay, so that Homebrew installation was successful, it says here. Now I should have said this as I was installing Homebrew, but you have to be an administrator on your machine to install some of these things. Now I'm the sole user on my new laptop, so I'm already an administrator. But if you're not an administrator, then you need to be on your machine. Okay, so now that we have Homebrew installed, now I'm going to pull down my automation scripts from my GitHub page. I put my scripts up on GitHub so that I can pull them down onto any machine. But first, let me make sure that Git is actually installed so that we can clone that repository. So if I run Git, then it looks like it displays the Git commands, so that works well. Sometimes it will ask you to install the command line developer tools, but I believe that it installed those command line developer tools for us whenever we installed Homebrew. 
Okay, so Git seems to be working. So now I'm going to pull down everything that I use to automate my software installations and preferences. Now these are in a repository on my GitHub called dot files. Now that repository name is a bit misleading because it started out as just a repository for my dot files. And now it's a repository for a few additional scripts as well. But that's no big deal. So let me go to that uh, repository, I'm just going to open it up in the browser. So I'm going to do a search here for uh, Corey Schaefer GitHub, and that should take me to my GitHub page. Okay, so now within here, I'm going to open my dot files repository. And let me make the screen a little larger here so that you can see. Now I'm just going to click on this section here where it says clone or download. And now I'm going to copy that URL that it says to clone the repository. So now I will go back to my terminal and I'm just going to simply say git clone and I'm going to clone that repository right inside of my home directory. So I am in my home directory and you should be too. So I'm going to run that and now if I do an ls then we can see that we have a dot files uh, directory here on or within my home folder. So that created my dot files directory in my home folder and that dot files folder has all of my dot files and scripts that will automate a lot of this setup. So let me give you a quick overview of these scripts and what they're going to do. Now a lot of these are bash scripts. Uh, so let me go back to GitHub to look at these scripts in this dot files directory. So I'm going to open up my GitHub here and this is the dot files repository that we just cloned. And now we can take a look at some of these files. So first, I'm going to open this install.sh script here. And if I scroll down to take a look at this, let me walk through this script. And again, let me make this text just a little larger here so that everyone can see. Okay, so at the very top, we can see that this is a bash script. And the comment here says, this script creates sim links from the home directory to any desired dot files in the home directory forward slash dot files. Uh, and it also installs homebrew packages and sets sublime preferences. So the first line here is basically just uh, telling us how to use this script. So we're going to say install.sh and then point our home directory uh, or pass in our home directory as an argument. And if it doesn't, then it'll just echo that out saying that that saying that we need to do that. So we're going to set a couple of variables here. Our home directory is going to be equal to that first argument. And then we're setting our dot file directory here to that home directory forward slash dot files. And now we have a list of files and folders here. And these are the dot files that I have within that dot files repository. So we have bash profile, bash RC, bash prompt, aliases, and this one's private. And now we CD into that dot files directory. And then we create sim links. Uh, and it says here, it'll overwrite the old dot files. We're creating sim links for all of those dot files within that files list. So we are echoing out that we're creating a sim link uh, for these different files. And here is where we're actually creating that sim link. So this is the target dot file here. And that is the file that is actually within our dot files repository. And we're creating a sim link in our home directory called dot and then the file. So dot bash rc dot bash underscore profile and so on. So after that, we are doing a little something extra here. We're downloading a git auto completion script so that we have a git auto completion within our terminal. And then I'm running this homebrew script and then I'm running this sublime script. So that is the installation script. Now let me go back here and we can take a look at some more of these files. So now we could take a look at some of these dot files here. So these dot files configure a lot of what I like to have in my terminal. So for example, bash prompt, uh, that will change the colors of my username and show me what directory I'm in and things like that. And I have a separate video going in depth as to what some of these dot files are doing. So I'll leave a link to that video in the description section below if anyone is interested to see more details about how this stuff works. But in this video, we're just going to focus more on finishing the setup of this machine. So the aliases dot file here uh, just has a bunch of aliases that I have uh, while using my command line. So 
for example, let's see what one of these dot files look like. I'm going to open up the aliases here and we can see that we just have a bunch of shortcuts. So I have one here called CH uh, that I use for commit history. And what that'll do is just run the history command and then pipe in uh, that output and search for git commits in the history. So if I just type CH, it's going to show me all the all my latest git commits. Um, HG is just history grep. So if I want to search my history for something, then I can just say, you know, if I wanted to look at the latest brew install, then I could just say HG brew, and it'll just show me all of the uh, history commands that have brew in the command. And just things like that. That's basically what these dot files are doing. So I'm going to go back here. And the bash profile is actually what gets run when you open up your terminal. And within here, it just sources all of the uh, files. So I say for file in bash prompt aliases uh, private, just source those files. And it also does the get auto completion there as well. Um, so that is how those aliases and the prompt get set from that bash profile. So the dot file section of that install script that we saw just links all of those dot files into my home folder so that all of that works. Now the applications for my machine are all going to get installed in this homebrew script and that's called brew.sh. So let me take a look at that. So if I scroll down here, so we can see at the top here that I'm installing a couple of brew packages. So we're installing Python by default. Mac doesn't have Python 3 installed, and that's what Brew will install here. I'm also installing the tree command, and those are the only command line applications that I'm installing for now. Uh, now, here are the Mac OS applications that I'm installing using Brew Cask. And again, if you don't know the difference between Brew install and Brew Cask install, then I would just recommend going, uh, going to watch that homebrew uh, tutorial that I did a week ago. But this is really what's going to save me a lot of time here. This is where we're installing all kinds of applications. So I'm installing Chrome, Firefox, Sublime Text, VirtualBox, uh, SourceTree, Spotify, Discord, uh, my Google Drive, Backup and Sync, Skype, GIMP, VLC, HyperDoc, Divi. Uh, HyperDoc and Divi are uh, applications that help you organize different applications on your desktop. And then down here at the bottom, I'm also installing the font that I like. So I like this source code pro font. So I can install that using uh, brew cask as well. Uh, and I also had to tap, tap a different repository here to install that. Okay, so now I'm going to go back here. Now, normally I would install more software in those scripts, such as Docker and Ansible and things like that. But I'm going to try to put a video on those uh, subjects together in the near future. So I want to show how to install those from scratch in those videos. But you can add any additional software that you'd like to scripts like this. Okay, and lastly, if you remember in that install script, uh, I'm also running this sublime.sh script here at the bottom. So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to open that up and scroll down here a little bit and i'm doing a couple of things here so this downloads the package control package uh, from their website and then it's putting it into my settings and it's calling it package control dot sublime package and then i am copying from those settings and putting those into where uh, sublime text has these installed on the operating system so it should be in this location here uh, in my home folder forward slash library forward slash applications su support uh, sublime text three and installed packages and these have spaces in here so these backspaces kind of make this look a little weird but really we're just escaping those spaces there now this to forward slash dev null here at the end just means that we're ignoring any errors. So if that directory doesn't exist, then it's just going to ignore that and not display it to the screen. Um, I, the reason I put that in is because maybe Sublime Text will change this install location at some point. Okay, so I'm also installing my own custom Sublime Text settings here by copying from my settings directory, and that's also in my dot files repository. We'll take a look at that here in a second. And these are my Sublime settings, and we're just putting those where Sublime Text expects those as well. And also, I'm creating some Python build systems here. I'm creating one for Python 2 and Python 3, and I'm putting those where Python, or where Sublime Text expects those build systems. And lastly, I'm creating a symlink here to the SUBL command. 
So Sublime Text has an SUBL command where you can use Py or use uh, Sublime Text within the command line, but they don't put it in your path automatically. So that's what I'm doing here. Okay, and just to show you one last thing here, let me also show you what some of those settings look like. So this is my settings folder here, and we can see that I have uh, some different things set up here. So I have my Sublime settings here, my Anaconda settings. These are my build systems here, and I also have my keyboard shortcuts here that I prefer as well. Now, I don't think I had those keyboard shortcuts in that Sublime script. So that might be a mistake on my part. So uh, I'll have to actually add that in manually. But after this video, I'll probably add it to that Sublime script so that that gets automated as well. But I'm not gonna worry about it for this video. Now, one thing I haven't been able to get working in terms of automating Sublime Text is for my desired packages to get installed automatically. Um, so if I open up my Sublime settings here, I looked it up online and apparently if I have this setting set here, these installed packages and have my preferred packages in here, then whenever we start up Sublime, uh, it should look at those and if they're not installed, then it should install those automatically. But I've never got that to work. So if anyone from Sublime, uh, Sublime Maintainer sees this video or if someone who knows what I'm doing wrong there, then I'd be interested to know because it'd be nice to automate that portion as well. Okay. and. Lastly, uh, one more thing about these scripts here is that they need to be executable. So mine were committed as executables, so they shouldn't need to be changed. Uh, but if you're creating scripts like this on your own, then you could, let me make this smaller and go back to the command line here. Um, let me cd into dot files. If I do an ls-la, then these are executable here. Um, but if they weren't and you were creating your own, then you could just do something like this, chmod, whoops, chmod plus x, and then the name of your script. So that's how you make something executable. Okay, so now let me actually run this installation script to set up this machine. Now, I know I've been talking a good bit in this video uh, to show you what these scripts are going to do, but if you imagine this process without me explaining everything along the way, then it actually goes extremely quickly to run these scripts and get this machine set up. So let me run these scripts and get these installations started. So I can do that by saying, first, let me get my home directory here. So I'm gonna do a PWD and just grab my home directory. I'm not gonna grab the dot files part uh, because remember, I need to pass in the home directory as an argument to that installation script. So I'm gonna say dot forward slash install dot sh and then pass in that home directory. So I'm going to run that and we can see that this starts downloading a few things here, but I'm gonna scroll up here to the top and it says changing to the, the dot files directory and then it created those sim links there and then it went out and started downloading a few things here. So now we can see Homebrew is installing a few different things. So let me scroll down here to the bottom. And so it's getting Python 3.7 at the moment. Okay, so this script has a lot to do. Uh, so I am going to uh, pause this video and then pick this back up once it's finished. Okay, so that script just completed. It installed a lot of software and that took, uh, I believe that started at 337 and now it is 346. So in less than 10 minutes, uh, we installed a ton of different software and changed a lot of different settings on our machine. Now there was one installation in there that required me to enter a password. So if you do something like this, then you might have to watch for that so that it doesn't hold up your scripts. Um, okay, so that's a lot less time than it would have taken to do all of that manually. In just a few minutes, we installed, uh, let me look back at the software here. So we installed Python 3, Google Chrome, Firefox, uh, Sublime Text, VirtualBox, Source Tree, Spotify, Discord, uh, Google Drive, Skype, GIMP, VLC, uh, different fonts, and changed all kinds of different settings. So a script like this can save you a ton of time. Um, so let's see what this did. So first of all, I'm going to shut down my terminal here, and I'm going to open back up my terminal. And we can see here that now my terminal looks more like it does in my normal videos because those dot files are now changing my preferences here uh, to where I have the colors and settings that I like. 
Now this is still using this other font. I'm hoping that my source code, code pro font was installed through that homebrew script. So let's test that out. If I go to preferences here and then try to change the font, um, let's see if uh, that font, let me go to all fonts and see if source code pro was installed and it was perfect. Okay, so there it is. I uh, got the source code pro font that I want and now that has changed. Now let's also look at our applications uh, to make sure it looks like a lot of these applications were installed. So we have Backup and Sync from Google. That's the uh, same as Google Drive, the replacement. Uh, we have Discord, Divi, Firefox, uh, GIMP, Google Chrome, and all of those. It looks like all of those were installed correctly, so that's great. Okay, so now let's see if some of those um, Google, whoops, let me see if uh, some of those um, homebrew packages that I wanted to install, install actually got installed. So by default, Python 3 isn't installed on a new Mac, but it should have been installed through homebrew since it was in my script. So if I say Python 3, then we can see that now I have Python 3 on this machine, so that's great. Um, so also it installed some other commands that aren't available by default. And one of those was the tree command. So if I clear my screen here and I say tree, I'm gonna do a tree on that dot files directory. If I run that, then we can see that tree works as well. And that now we have a nice tree directory structure of my dot files directory here within my command line. Now I'm not gonna go over every little thing that was installed, but I would like to check Sublime Text and make sure that it was installed as well. So our Sublime script should have created a, a command line shortcut for us to open Sublime with the subl command. So I should be able to open the dot .files directory within Sublime simply by saying subl dot .files. So let's try that. Okay, and it looks like that works as well. So Whenever you first install some applications, it might ask you if you're sure you want to open it. I'll just say open there. And now we have Sublime Text opened up here. And instead of making this full screen, let me actually just enlarge this instead. Whoops, let me just enlarge this here. Now, like I was saying before, Sublime should look at my settings and see that installed packages setting and go out and automatically install those packages. Uh, but I've never actually got that to work. So um, before I check if that worked, let me instead just make sure that I have my settings file where it should be. So if I go to settings, okay, it doesn't look like I have my Sublime Text settings here for some reason. So let me check why this is. If I go to browse packages here, let me see where this is actually located on my machine. So what I can do is drag this into my terminal. Okay, so I'm actually not sure why that didn't work because it looks like that is the correct path that I would expect. Uh, let me instead try to run that script manually because maybe it didn't work for some reason. So I'm gonna cd into my dot .files and let me try to run that sublime.sh script manually. So if I run that, then let me go back to my Sublime Text here. Um, okay, and it looks like that worked now. So now I have all of my uh, custom settings here. Let me restart Sublime and see if it picks up any of those changes. Now, sometimes these automation scripts, I mean, they can save you a ton of time, uh, but sometimes you run into things like this where you need to make some minor tweaks. Okay, so let me close that down. And I'm getting some errors here because it's saying that it can't find the installed packages. So uh, that is a problem that I've always had before. So we should at least have package control installed. So we do. And if I do that, then we can try to install some of those packages manually. So for example, Predon is the theme and that's already looking a bit better. And also if I install a package for the material theme, let me install that. And once that is installed, then it should clear up some of this. Okay, so now that that material theme is installed, then this is looking a bit better here. And we can see uh, that this looks more like how I normally have it set up, 
but there are some differences here. So I'm going to have to go in and install all of my other packages uh, manually because I've never been able to get those uh, to install automatically. So I'm going to close down Sublime Text there for a second. Now I'm still not sure why that Sublime script didn't run. Um, if I look at my install.sh script, uh, so we have sublime.sh, is that the same name? Yeah, so I'm not sure why that didn't run at the end of our installation, uh, but for some reason it seems like it didn't. So I'm going to have to go back and take a look at that and see exactly why uh, that didn't install correctly. So let me exit that out for now, and I'll also quit my terminal here. Okay, but basically that's how I go about setting up a new development machine. So we can see that these scripts carried a lot of the weight for us and did a ton of work that would have taken us a long time to do manually. And not only does it take a long time to do stuff like this manually, but if you don't have it scripted out, then it's also prone to mistakes. So for example, I could, you know, forget to install that Sublime Text shortcut with the SUBL command. And then a couple of days later, uh, just have to do that and go out and figure that out. And then I could realize that one of my settings are off and that I need to fix that. You know, having it automated like this just takes a lot of the headache out of the equation. Now, that's usually as much as I automate. I'm constantly adding to these scripts and settings and also making corrections. So the fact that it didn't run that Sublime script is something that I'm going to need to go in and fix. And once I have that fixed, I'll upload it to my GitHub so that next time it works properly. Um, but I don't actually try to automate every little process if I think that it's going to be too difficult. There are some things that I do manually. So for example, I'm going to manually sign in to the programs that I installed. So I need to go and sign in to Chrome and my Google Drive. I need to log in to Spotify and things like that. Um, I'm going to, you know, manually rearrange my dock down here at the bottom. Now, one thing that I usually do there is just take a snapshot of my dock from my last development machine and put it into my Google Drive so that I know that I have it, uh, how I had it arranged. Now, I also have my preferred desktop background saved in my Google Drive as well. So after I sign in to that backup and sync from Google, and once those files are actually synced to this computer, then I can go in and change my desktop background as well. But all of that stuff is just really minor and doesn't take much time at all. All of the big time consuming items that I have scripted, like all of the applications that we installed, those go nice and quick. Like I was saying earlier, uh, before I had scripts like this, it could really take me an entire day to get all of this software installed manually and set up all these preferences how I like them. And now I've got that down to just a fraction of the time. Okay, so I think that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully you found this video interesting and learned a bit about how you can automate the setup of a new development machine. Uh, even if you don't have as many personal preferences as I have, even just using Homebrew to install things like Chrome and the other applications that you use a lot will save you a lot of time. But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. And if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.